Oak House Church brings to you the word of life which is able to build you up and offer you an inheritance among all those that are sanctified. Sit back and listen and may your life become more like that of Christ as you encounter his word. God bless you. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection. Another word for that perfection is maturity. He said, not laying again the foundation of, the, of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God, and of the doctrine of baptism and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And then verse 3 said, please be just fast. He said, and this we will do if God permits. What is it that we will do if God permits? What is it? If God permits us, we can now go on to what? Maturity. Do you know why? Because if you have not understood the basic and elementary doctrines of Christ, you cannot handle the maturity aspect of it. You will not be able to grasp it. And if you decide on your own to jump into it and all of that, the consequences are found in verse 5. And verse 4 and 5, that is the consequences. If you have not been able to lay hold on maturity, I mean on the um, uh, the foundation, the basic foundation, if you have not understood it well and you decide to skip it just like that and move on to maturity, the consequences of it is what we found in verses 4 and 5. And that is why he said it is impossible for those who have once enlightened and have they said the heavenly gift and we are partakers of the Holy Ghost and all of that. And in the course of it, that is why we have a lot of people today. Some of us are apostles, some of us are bishops and all of that. And they are making shipwreck of the faith of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The reason is because the foundation were not properly taken care of. So I want to suggest <coughs> if you have done Berea Academy, the, I mean the Model 1 and 2, anytime they are doing Model 1 and 2 refresher courses or makeup classes rather, I would suggest that you go back again and do it. What we are dealing with has to do with the eternal destinies of men. If you have understood the foundational doctrines of Christ that is repentance from dead work and all of that eternal judgment and resurrection from the dead you will understand the importance of what we are going to be dealing with when you don't understand it if we are talking about this it will see be <coughs> excuse me it will see be um, business as usual so having said that let's go on to the business of the day so we're talking about maturity and we start with uh, Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 to 15. And uh, you can give us um, NLT or NIV so that I don't have to do a lot of um, explanation because of want of time. He said, not that I have already obtained all this. Or have already been made perfect. I have not been made perfect yet. I have not arrived yet. I am still on the journey. He said, but I press on to take hold of that which, of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. That is, he's talking about perfection, maturity. But one thing I do, what is this one thing that he do, or that he did, is that forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. Please, um, the child that is talking, you know, we are recording, and the noise goes into the... <coughs> 
so not as though as I have already attained either we are already perfect but I follow after if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus brethren I count not myself to have apprehended but this one thing I do forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before I press forward to the back of the prize of the high calling which is in Christ Jesus our Lord <clears throat> maturity maturity is about becoming like Jesus Christ is about becoming like Christ himself in his image and in his likeness that is what maturity is all about and it is a journey that starts right from the day you receive Jesus Christ into your heart as your Savior you will start the process of making him your Lord you expose yourself to him and you continue to learn of him and become like him so that you can act like him talk like him speak like him and do all those things that he did so you be like a lamb of Christ or a lamb of God and at the same time the lion of the tribe of Judah so that is fullness of Jesus Christ that is the journey that each and every one of us should be making and this should be the vision of every Christian give me Ephesians chapter 2 uh, Ephesians 4 verse 13 please fast Ephesians 4 13 until we all reach the unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ then we will no longer be infants you see we will no longer be infant tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming because there are so much and as a result of as a matter of fact majority of us are where we are today as a result of the kind of teachings the kind of exposure that you have received a woman came this evening i was actually in the house i was getting ready for all this and um, i got a message that somebody was waiting for me in the church and that i had an appointment she i had an appointment or rather that i gave her an appointment i couldn't figure how manage and when and how but anyhow i decided to just come and when I came, I saw the woman. When she began to talk, I remembered somehow in the past, after a particular meeting, yeah, I think uh, um, Night of Power, I just remember then when she was talking. And I actually, she asked me which of the days for counseling and all of that. I said, you come on Mondays, I will see with you. So I just awkward. I said, okay, so why are you here? And then she began to talk about the kind of problems that she has gone through in life and however she opened her mouth and said to me that she has met so many men of God even that the geo of the redeemed has also prayed for her and laid hands on her but her problem persists and why she came was that he said she saw a banner of uh, the program that was coming up and so there was a particular name of the woman he mentioned the name of the woman i can't remember so when she mentioned the name of the i said but the woman is not here we didn't have any poster that appears the names of different um, ministers and all of that and we don't even have any name of any minister on the whatever so in the course of whatever i remember that it was this church here that had the poster so she was looking for a woman who was invited for that program that she wanted to see her so that she can pray for her and lay hands on her after G.O. You see, how did it start? Where did she begin? 
is the same thing that we are dealing. There are many of them today. Majority, there are many uncounted. They are in their millions. That's what the Bible is talking about in the book of Ephesians, chapter 4. To solve this problem. That is why go to verse 2. <coughs> verse 12. Sorry, I beg, I beg your pardon. Verse 12. So he said, the reason why he gave the apostles and the prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers in the church, the reason why God ordained them and gave them as a gift to the church is to prepare God's people for the service, for the work of service. Number one, if you if it's the um, 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 King James Version, he says to mature the saint, maturity first. And then to serve. And then to edify the church. So there are three reasons why the fivefold ministries are given. Number one is to mature the saints, which is actually what we are beginning to do now. We have laid that foundation. So if your foundation is faulty, you are not going to build, you are not going to attain this maturity as you ought to. So this foundation is to prepare God's people, number one, for the work of service, number two, and so that the body of Christ may be built up. Now, so you see, the maturity is not an end. Maturity here is not an end, it's a means. Because the end of maturity is that you are going to become a servant. You begin to serve in the house of God. That is actually the purpose of maturity. Because before you can begin to serve God, you need to be taught. We need to be trained. We need to be guarded. We need to be informed on how to serve God. You can't just serve God anyhow. God is so big. God is so excellent. God is righteous, is holy. You have to understand the modus operandi, the way God operates. You must understand what pleases him and what displeases him. You must know who God is. You can't just force anything on him. You can't just give him any house service and ex um, expect him to accept it. He will not. Before people go to serve or become uh, an ADC to either the president or the governor, or you become even a cup bearer or become anything at all in the, in the king's palace or even in the presidential or the governor or whoever, those big, great men or big men and all that, before you go to serve them, you have to learn. There are protocols you must have to understand before you can do that. In the same way, you can't just come to serve God. You can't just budge into the church and say you want to serve God and all of that if you have not been taught. So we say, the reason why we are talking about maturity, God wants us to mature, is number one. So after the maturity, you are now prepared to serve God. So that when you hear a lot of people say that they have served God and they have been serving and they have been serving and you look into their life, you see little or nothing to show for it. So the reason is because you can serve God, you can serve God in quotes for 20 years and all that you have done in the name of service does not have one record of it in heaven. And so the blessing that's supposed to accompany that your service both in this life and in the life to come, is nowhere to be found. So like I said, it's a journey that begins once you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. And it continues. When it's going to end is on the day that you meet with Jesus Christ face to face. That is when your maturity is going to end. And so, Evidence to prove that you are qualified to sit in this class now for this maturity. The evidence, number one, is that your priorities about life has changed. 
it is because your priorities have changed if your priority is still yourself my house my husband my family my cousin my mother my father if they are still your priority before ever you think about god you have not you are not yet ready for the journey if you have i'm going to show you i'm going to tell you what it means to putting god first because when we talk about putting god first we think um, putting god first means If you, if somebody is offering you a bribe and you are fixed between either accepting the bribe or rejecting the bribe, yeah, that is, a, that is part of putting God first, but, it, but that is the elementary. Putting God first means everything in its totality. If, for example, you are supposed to conduct prayer meeting in the church hmm? and your father dies and you just receive a note that your father dies and your brothers and your sisters are coming from all parts of the world to come and meet you know so that you people can plan and all of that or maybe for the burial and you are supposed to hold prayer meeting you will leave that until you are done with everything about the service of God, before you give attention to that. That is what it means putting God first. And when you do that, when you do that, your father, your mother, your uncle, your cousin, they will take offense. They will persecute you. They will call you names. Because if you don't do that, it means that you are still a pleaser of men. You are still interested in people more than you are to God. And so that is why when we talk about maturity, it's not for children. You know, we keep hearing it. Jesus Christ said, a young man came to him and said, I want to go and bury my father and all of that. He said, don't go. Okay, the other one said, the one that is very simple. He said, okay, I have agreed. I'm going to follow you and serve you for the rest of my life. But just to go and say to them, bye-bye, you will not see my face again. He said, don't go. You see, that is why I said, maturity class is not just to come and sit down because you, you believe you have done foundation class. Maturity class is that your priority, number one, has changed. <clears throat> if your priority has not changed, you are not yet matured. You might have been born again for 30 years or 50 years but you can still be a baby if your priority has not changed god first that is why he said seek ye first that word as simple as it is as simple as it is many many even some of us who are behind the pulpit preaching don't even understand and believe that scripture and not even talking about obeying it Maturity is that your priority has changed. And then secondly, you have moved from pleasing men to pleasing God. You become a servant of God and not a servant of men. That is, we're still talking about qualities of evidence or proof that you are now a mature Christian. <clears throat> The first is that your priorities have changed. Number two is that you are no longer a servant of men, but a servant of God. You are not looking at people's faces anymore. You are not moved by what they say or by what they do. You are not moved by their... verdict but you are moved by God what God says matters and you see that's why the Bible says anyone that wants to be godly in this life you must suffer 
persecution in the hands of people. You must be misunderstood. If people do not misunderstand you, then you are a servant of men. If you want to please people and displease God, you are a servant of men, not a servant of God. <coughs> Excuse me. So the third one, evidence or proof that you are mature or you are qualified to be in this class is that you have made yourself committed to the obedience to God and his word. It is the word of God that counts, irrespective of how you feel, irrespective of how they feel, irrespective of how complicated the situation has been. You stand on the word of God. It's the word of God that drives you. It's the word of God that moves you. Irrespective, no matter you are not a, you are not emotional person and you don't bring emotions into it because you want to bring emotions and all of that. You start weeping sentiments and stuff like that. No. You have come to the point where the word of God is not to be contested in your life. It's not that you have, you see what Paul said, it's not that I have arrived. But one thing that I know, I put behind everything and I keep pressing for the mark of the, of the price of the high calling which is in Christ. These are the three conditions for you to be here today. Number one is that what? Your priorities have changed. Number two is what? First is that you have put God first. You know another thing that, you know another meaning of putting God first? Mrs. Stella, you just got ready now. You know the day you told me that you're going to travel on so and so day in August and then you come back. And then on that very day, you're on your way to the airport and you are already in the airport and you see my call i say yes pastor i say how are you mrs stella he said i'm fine i say i'm about to board the plane and when i get to ghana i will call you i said don't board that plane just come back too hard is it not is it not too hard that's why you are a mature person that's for maturity people who are in the flesh cannot take it because it could be that there's something god tells me to keep you from traveling and it could be that god wants to take you to some higher heights and he wants to prove you first to test whether you're able to pass this test before he gives you, he proves you. Before he puts you up there, there are some tests he will give you. He will break. Any other person around you, you will hear it. He will say you're mad. You see, so that is why there are things we do we just take it lightly with us and all of that that is why i said if you don't attend maturity class if you don't attend this maturity class you cannot follow us next year i mean in the way of serving god you can't because there are some things we are going to be doing and we are going to move faster than we used to the end is around the corner we cannot just continue to be crawling. And you cannot do that with babies, with people who are still drinking milk and all of that. No, you are going to have a lot of casualties. So that's why I have mentioned the condition for you to be in this class. If you have not attained it, then you are not yet mature. So you are not ready for service. Because what is involved in this service, you find out that you have not been serving God before. That what we have been doing is uh, you serve God in according to your, in your own terms. 
because you see, God will not put a demand on you until He first of all does what teaches or trains you or informs you or prepares you before He will put that demand. And so that is why we have not had any demand of any sort at all. Nobody has ever been put under that kind of demand in this church. And I know what I'm saying. The reason is because that understanding, that knowledge, that training has not been given. But now it is being given. After that, that demand is going to come. So you see, like I said, maturity is not an end. It is a means. Because there is no need for you, when you keep learning, and you keep learning, and you are not giving out, if you are just eating, and you are eating, and you are not giving out, you are not using the loo, you are not wee-wee, you don't urinate, you don't use the loo and all of that, you are going to have a problem. So when you are receiving the impartation and the message and the word and you are being fed, if you don't have the means of giving out, you are going to be stunted, you are going to be stagnated, uh, uh, you are stagnated and you are going to become um, um, apathetic, spiritual apathy will step in. That is why you see people who have been, who have been in the church for 10 years, for 20 years, for 30 years, they have been born again and they have been hearing the word of God and there is no way they don't give. They don't give out. There is no expression at all. They are the greatest cause of the problem in the body of Christ because everything they have received they are expected to give out and they are not giving out they hold it they keep it to themselves and that is where spiritual lethargy comes in spiritual apathy when you get in when you get closer to them the zeal for god in your life dies if you're on fire for god when you get closer to them it dies that's why the bible wants or god wants us to be fervent in this we be our glow in the spirit serving god so it's not just about being a globe but you'll be serving so if you're hearing and you are receiving and you are not giving out you become deadened your heart becomes callous that is why he said we should break our pharaoh ground because when you hear the word of God and you hear it and you are not obedient to that word, you don't practice it, you don't go out, you don't express yourself, you become stagnated. In science, in, um, in, um, <coughs> there is what they call atrophy. The hand can become atrophied. That is this hand now on my leg. If you don't use it, for a long time if for example something happened and you're bedridden and you don't use your leg you don't exercise it 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 atrophies what it means is that it it thins down it becomes thin the energy and the muscle and all of that grows thin because of disuse they call it disuse atrophy so if you are doing, if you are learning something, if you're hearing the message of God and you are hearing it and you are not expressing it, you can, number two is that you cannot grow. That growth will not be there because the essence of maturity is for you to grow. And you can only grow when you have, when you, when you engage yourself in exercise. They call it spiritual exercise. That's why he says spiritual exercise does what? profit all it has a promise in this life and in the life to come so when you keep hearing the word of god win soul do this or do that or serve god and do all of that and you are not doing it you can't grow you can't tell me you're growing and that is what we have in the body of christ in their millions and in their thousands and in their hundreds 
You hear people when you say, what you say you've been born again for how many years? For five years, for 10 years, for 20 years. What department are you in the church? What actually are you doing? And when we talk about department in the church, you're serving in the church, it's not coming to be sweeping the floor and then you're, you know, you have to engage yourself. Spiritual exercise. You have to be committed to the extent that your life is involved. Not the one that, uh, you know, convenient, the one that is, suits you, that will not, um, you know, put enough, any pressure on you. You just do it later and then you go so that you have a lot of time. So we say study without service leads to spiritual stagnation and serving without studying leads to spiritual lethargy. If you want these slides, you can have it later. So, but it's important you... <coughs> we are still talking about maturity. The topic we want to deal with today is on service. So that's why I said it's a sixth credit load. So one of the keys for maturity, if you're going to be mature, one thing that is required is that you have to be a person of consistency, a consistent Christian consistent in that you are constantly doing that thing that you are committed to do. Whether there is rain falling or whether there is sun shining or whether there is tempest everywhere, no matter what it is you are, the Jesus said, blessed is that man that when his master comes, he will be found doing that same thing that he was committed to do. Consistency. If you are not a consistent person, you can't be a mature person. You are not qualified to begin to serve God in the first place. Number two, is that you're going to be a person of perseverance. You persevere, you endure, you take pressure. Discomfort is going to come in the place of service. So you have to be equipped with all of this before you start the service. That is why he said, I set apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers to equip you for the equipment of the brethren, of the Christians, so that they can serve. So you have to have that spiritual energy, the inner strength to endure. Peter, Paul was writing to Timothy, he said, as a soldier, endure hardness. You can't serve God because it is, uh, you know, some of these things that we do. You remember the people that brought us this gospel? Some of them died on the road. Some of them died in the sea. Some of them were eaten by wild beasts. Some of them were killed. Yet, the next group heard what happened to the, their predecessors. And yet, they stepped out to continue. You must have that kind of equipment. And of course, in order to do this, that is why you need the discipline that is needed. And so, one of the actionable things you are going to be doing, number one, is that you find out you, you are a regular student of the Bible. You study the Bible, study the Word of God always. The Bible, the book of the Bible, which is the book of books, the Word of God, will not be a stranger to you. You are someone who studies your Bible. You don't, you don't just read, you study the Bible always. Number two, that is why he said in 2 Timothy, he says, study to show yourself approved. A right workman not being ashamed of himself. If you are a mature Christian, 
this will be evidence in your life. This is what you continue doing, even till today. Number two is that you have to be a prayerful person. Your prayer life must be up. Men ought always to pray without ceasing. According to Luke 18.1, and next one is fellowship with the brethren. He tells us in Hebrews 10.25, never to forsake the assembling of the brethren. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. They have a habit. It's their culture. They only come when it is convenient. When it is not convenient, you will not see them. They will have cogent, reasonable reasons why they will not come, why they will not be there. Then the second, the next one is found in Matthew 20, 28. He says, is to serve. You serve. A mature person will commit himself to the service of God. And then finally, you are 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 1 tells us he says just as the son of God did not come to deserve but to serve and to give his life a ransom so the last one is still worship 1 Corinthians 4 words. so then men ought all to regard us as servants of Christ as those entrusted with the secret of God Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. Give me is verse 1 that I said, verse 1. You are a steward. A steward is someone that is committed. Something is committed into your hand. Something is given to you. That particular department, that particular assignment, that particular job, that particular position was given to you. And you are a steward. And that thing does not die in your hand. And there will be no cause for the leadership to start complaining or having headache over what is committed into your hand. If that is the case, it means you are not mature in the first place. You are not even qualified to begin to serve God. Think about it. If Jesus Christ, he committed the ministry to these 12 apostles, one finally exited. If they were not faithful stewards, by today, the gospel would have died. It would have come to an end. There are some of us, if you come, if you, there are things you commit into their hand and all of that, you will see that they are dead. If you just want all of that, the fastest way to get it, to stop it, know that that thing will never see the light of the day. Just give it, and that is the end. It's a very bad thing very bad very very so you see it's not even about saying that it is bad in the first place such people are not qualified you are not qualified to come into the service of god because god commits anointing onto your life he commits anointing of god he puts anointing on you that anointing is wasted. You are not using it. You are not making use of that anointing or that grace that God has given to you in order to serve. And that thing will be wasted. And why it is given to you is so that you can serve and advance the cause of God's kingdom and all of that. But you are not doing it. That thing dies in your hand. And meanwhile, you know, as we shall see, at the end of the day, you are going to give an account of all this. Whether you are aware of it or you are not aware of it. Whether you believe it or you don't believe it. Whatever you think you are thinking, go ahead and think it. But one thing that is certain, that is why we have studied the foundational doctrines of Christ. Resurrection of, from the dead and eternal judgment. The foundation has been laid. So it is clear. You will not say that you are not taught. That you don't know. On that day, you are going to stand in judgment for all of this. 
Amen. That is um, about maturity. So we can now do the Christian service proper. So we go back to Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. There are two words that define the life of every Christian. It defi- that is what your life is defined in these two words. Nothing more, nothing less. Don't add to it, don't remove from it. Every other thing that you are preaching, every other thing, revelation you are catching, whatever it is that you are doing is revolving round around these two. He said, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You see, the two things that revolves, your life revolves around, number one is to serve. Number two is to give. It is not just enough to serve. You must give. Because Jesus Christ is a perfect example Jesus Christ is the perfect example. The Bible said that he came to not to be served. Because a lot of people want to be served. They love serving. They want to be served. They want to sit in the high places. And then they'll be served. And they're calling them mommy and daddy. I know mommy G-O, papa G-O, you know, father in the Lord, mother in the Lord. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. And everybody is around you. They are flocking around you and all of that. We love service. We love to be served. Naturally, man does not want to serve. Because if you understand the servanthood of a Christian, the, the Christian service, if you understand that, as we are going to see, you find out that it is not in man to serve. And what they are doing out there is not service. They are loading it over the people. When, when a governor who is supposed to be your servant is, you know, when he is coming now with all his entourage and all of that with their siren, you yourself, they killed one of my whatever in my village, one old man. In the police escort. And they have done that many times in there. And if you stand in their way for whatever reason, they will pack and they beat the hell out of you and put you inside the boot and carry you to the government house and leave you there to die. Some are shot. So that's not the service we are talking about. When you, when you understand what it means to serve, you means you, some of you will not, because you find out that it is not naturally a man to serve. You want to feel big. You don't want to put yourself down. You want to, you dress well, you speak well. And when you dress well and you speak well, you can't humble yourself. You can't come down to the So you don't want to dirty yourself. But Jesus Christ is a perfect example. So two things, to serve and to give. What are you serving and what are you giving? So we say that service is the heart of the Christian life. Is the bedrock, the bedrock, the foundation, is the engine of your heart. Is the, that is what defines your life, service and giving. So, but you know what we have just dealt with. Before you come into service, you have to be mature. Before you can, you will see the reason why you needed to be that before you can do the service of God. So what do you serve? Number one, there are two things you serve. The first is that you serve God. I'm going to tell you what it means to serve God. Number two is that you serve in the gospel. This is where your service begins and ends. Anything outside of this is not service. It's not Christian service. 
you serve God and you serve in the gospel. Give me Mark chapter 10 verse 29. I tell you the truth. Jesus replied, no one who has left home, <coughs> excuse me, or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel. Give me King James. I didn't say verse 30, just verse 29. And Jesus answered and said, verily I say unto you, there is no man that had left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife Remember here, he didn't say wives. Or wife, or husband. He didn't say husband here, sorry. And there is a reason. Or children, or land for my sake. For who? Sake. Christ. And two people, two entities. You serve Christ, you serve the gospel. You serve in the gospel. Give me Romans 1 9. Romans 1 9. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the word. I serve in my spirit in the gospel of his son. So you serve God, you serve in the gospel. Philippians 2 22. Let me rub it in well. But you know the proof of him that as a son with a father, he had served with me where? So that service has to be defined. I hear people say they serve God in, the, in their business. They are just, they just escape routes. They also want to give them, say, you are serving God in your business. No, you are making money and uh, enjoying yourself. So the thing you serve, two entities, God or Christ, and what? In the gospel. What do you give? This, because he said to serve. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give. So we've seen what he's going to serve. He's going to serve God. He's going to serve in the gospel. We're going to see what it means to serve God and to serve in the gospel. Then the second, which is to give. What do you give? Two things you give. First, your life. <laughs> Mark chapter, Matthew chapter 20, verse 28, that place where we read the scripture, we read, it says... For Jesus did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his what? Life, a ransom. is to give his life. You see, that is why maturity is not for children. If you have not come to the point where it is about your life, and life laid down, you have not started. Because you have to first of all surrender your life. We're going to see what it means. Because this is the kind of service, this is how God wants to be served. Luke chapter 14, 26. Luke chapter 14, 26. I would just prefer God, anointing of speed will come upon you. Luke. If any man come to me and, ha and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sister, yea, his own, his own what? Life also he cannot be my disciple. Your life you must give. And anyone that has given his life, you are ready to give any other thing. If you give your life, there is nothing else you cannot give. You will give God, you will empty. If they say that you are only car, you will drop it. 
If they say that your job, you will drop it. They say that your business, you will close it down. If you have laid your life. So the demand is your life must go, must be laid down. If you're not ready to lay down your life, then you're not ready to serve God. Because there are demands. First John 3, 16. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for, for us, and we ought to do what? We ought to do what? Lay down our life. For who? For the brethren. Is a life laid down. If you dedicate, if you make up your mind, you want to serve God, the first thing is that what is demanded of you is a sacrifice of your life. God wants to take a sacrifice of your life. And once he collects your life, <laughs> nothing else is left. This movement, eh? you distract me a lot. And you cut off the flow. God help me. Second Corinthians 8 1. Second Corinthians 8 1. It's about the church in Macedonia, the brethren in Macedonia. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. Verse 2, we are reading up to verse 5. How that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. You see, what they give. They were in deep poverty. They were still giving. It's not just to give your life. There are two things you give. You give your life, which is for their own power, I bear record here, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves, verse 4, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints, verse 5. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves, their lives. To who? To the Lord. And unto? And unto who? How many of you are also ready to give your life for me? It's the only one hand. But he said to the Lord and unto us. I didn't ask you to come and die for me. I'll be able to die for myself. I know that is what you are thinking. But it's a life laid down. If you are going to serve God, this is the demand. <laughs> There's no shortcut. If you are not ready to do that, then you are not ready to serve. There should be no discussion in the class. Please. Luke chapter 14, 33. The second thing that you are going to give, we have seen it in this uh, 2 Corinthians 8. They gave, they were giving their gift. They gave everything, even in their deep. The Bible didn't just, you know, deep is, uh, is an adjective that qualifies the kind of poverty. Okay? Deep is an adjective that qualifies the noun. The noun is poor, that these guys are poor. But he described the level of poverty. He said they were, what is the description? What is the, the, the qualification of the poverty? Deep poverty. They were deep in poverty. And yet they were, and yet they were. So who is supposed to give? Deep poverty. You know what is poverty? When a poor man calls you a poor man, when a poor man calls you poor, 
then you know that you are deep in poverty. So likewise, whoso he be of you that forsake not all that he did what cannot be my disciple. You can't serve me. You can't follow me. You've got to get to that point. And guess what? You know all this is. It's just a, you know what? You know there. Is, I'm sure as I'm talking now, there is a fight. There is a fight going on. You know what that is? Is self-preservation. Is self-preservation. You want to preserve your life. Jesus said, if you want to preserve your life, what will happen to you? What will happen to you? You will lose it. But if you're ready to lay it down, if you're ready to lose it, what will happen? It's a choice. Is a choice. Self-preservation. Self-love. I was talking to them in, uh, in the BTS last Tuesday. I was talking about marriage, how that your, your husband and you and your husband are one. Your money is your husband. Your husband's money is your own. There is nothing like my money and your money. All those things does not exist. Yet some people were saying it, and though they were joking, but they mean what they are saying. It wasn't a joke. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. He said, uh, jokingly, uh, Pastor, my husband's money is our money. My money is my money. Why? Self is full of self. He's self. You know, some that because we don't want to call it by his name, we just give baptismal name. You know, sin is, uh, we say, corrupt politicians. Corrupt politicians. No. If you want to, that's baptismal name. If you want to call it by his name, evil politicians. They are evil. Evil is wittier. You see, this man is evil. If you want to serve, who do you serve? What are the entities you serve? First, you serve who? And second, you serve in the gospel. So you cannot be serving in the ministry of um, minds and power or ministry of uh, information or ministry of uh, of uh, and say you are serving God you are serving nothing you say your service is in the gospel the advancement of the gospel the kingdom of God advancement of the kingdom and its establishment that's what you are evolving and you are not shaking and you are not pretending and you are not compromising either. Why will I compromise for Christ's sake? Why will I be intimidated in the face of somebody who is not a member of the kingdom? Or even a kingdom, a, a, a Christian, a fellow Christian who is living a carnal life and all of that. And then I, you, I come in the, your presence and you get me intimidated. <coughs> Excuse me. Or I compromise. <coughs> Why? You and I, who is better? Because you have a car, a jeep, black jeep that is tall and big. Because you are living in, uh, you are living in in heaven, in, in second heaven. I'm not intimidated. The intimidation is out of the issue. We don't even talk about. I don't have. I don't even have any. It's not a, it's not, we don't even talk about it. I feel ashamed talking about me being intimidated in the face of who are you? I will tell you about Christ. I will preach the gospel. You can't restrict me. 
I will say it right to your face. You can't do nothing. You are under my feet. With all the things you have, you think you have, you are stinking, you are smelling. You need salvation. You need God. If God will open your eyes one day and you see the end of these people, these people that you see, when God opens your hand, what does it mean to serve God? What does it mean to serve in the gospel? What does it mean to give your life? What does it mean to give everything that you have for the sake of the gospel and advancement of the gospel? Now, let's, let me answer that question by looking at the unique nature of the Christian service. The unique nature. Why Christian service is different from serving in the United Nations. Why Christian service is different from being the Secretary General of the United Nations. Why serving God is different from every other thing you can think about. <clears throat> why it is the most important if you have not served God you have not served you have not served if you have not served God you don't have a life to live every soul created by God is commanded to serve God is not suggested is commanded so number one, I said, the uniqueness or the nature, the unique nature of Christian service, number one, is in its source. The source, the source, first is the source. I will explain. And I explain it with 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 to 21. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 to 21. Therefore, if any man be in Christ is a new creature, all things have passed away, behold, all things have become new. Verse 18. And all things are of God who had reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. All things are of God who had reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and had given us, given to us what? The ministry of reconciliation. And has given us what? The ministry of reconciliation. Yes, verse 19. To wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and had committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now that we are the ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he had made him to be seen, for who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God. Now, why do I, what is, why is a Christian service different from every other service you are rendering? The first is from a source. The source of your Christian service comes from the fact that you were dead and you are good for nothing but to face the fiery raging of the fire, unquenchable fire in the lake that burns with sulfur and brimstone. That is where your end is supposed to be all have sinned and they have come short of the glory of God and the wages of sin is dead 
the wages of sin is death and so somebody just came and rescued your life somebody now came in and rescued you from destruction and saved your life what are you going to do with that life that now that you are rescued to go back and do and the person that rescued you is telling you the reason why I rescued you is so that you can serve me because you did not have any other opportunity to do anything your life has come to an end and not just to an end to do destruction and so he reached out to you and saved you from sin save you from hell save you from eternal destruction so what are you going to do with your life go back again and be con to continue with what you are doing if he didn't save you, what will you be doing now? Will you have a life to live in the first place? The answer is no. Will you have the, 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 the time to go back and do your job and do whatever it is that you want to do? The answer is no. If he didn't rescue you, will that man that is looking for you call your boss and you are subservient to him and all of that? Will he have the time? Listen, if you are down now, you are sick. If you are sick now, to the extent that you are admitted in the hospital, they will abandon you and move on with their lives. The only one that can save you again is the same person that is calling you. They don't have your interests at heart. You think they do. They give you all those emoluments and they give you all those incentives and all of that and brainwash you. Wait until the dice are down, are cast. The down is cast. Wait until the they go and get stuff. You see what will happen. And so these are the people we give our life and give our time, give everything, sold out to them. So serving God is just an addition when you have chance. You see, eh? you see, you see this service to God. You serve God in your own convenience. You've walked and walked and walked and walked the whole day. You are tired. When it's time to come for prayer meeting, oh, I'm so fucked up. I can't do it. I can't go. You sleep off. Let me just have. It's God's time you're taking. You see, is the mind is the way you program your mind the thing is in the mind this thing is in the mind is in the mind of man is the mind set if you reset it your activity your actions and everything will change if you try to change it and all of that it will not work you will change it today it will work today tomorrow um, after that you go back to square one but if you reset it from your mind is a mind reset. Somebody saved you and healed you. And he's not calling you in order for you to, to collect everything. What do you what do you have? What do you what do you have? that you did not receive. The Bible tells us. Is there anything that you have that you did not receive? And if you receive it, why then should you boast or brag? He's not calling you to take anything from you. He has nothing. All that you have, your life, he gave to you. You came into this world naked and you go back naked. He is actually calling you to bless you, to give you a higher life. Jesus said, I came that you might have life and you might have it more abundantly. It's an abundant life. But we are turning it down. Do you know why? Because of the cares of this life. Because of the deceitfulness of riches. Because of your boss. Because of your cousins. Because of your in-laws. Because of your outlaws. because of mother, because of father, because of sisters, you turn God down. 
So the uniqueness of the Christian service is in this is in this sense. Number one, it is unique in its source. Number two, it is unique in its objective. What is unique in his objective? The objective is to model servanthood. When you see a Christian that is serving, what it means here is to make yourself of no reputation. It is unique in this sense that anyone that is serving God, when you see that man, when you see that woman, is as meek as David. I mean, as uh, Moses. God said that Moses was the meekest man on earth as a servant he has no reputation to protect he has no reputation Philippians chapter 2 verse 4 Look not every man on his own thing, but every man also on the things of others. Verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. Let this mind be in what? In me. <clears throat> Let this mind be in me. Say, I have the mind of Christ. And what is that mind? You are going to see what is this like. Let this mind be be in you which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God but what did he do he made himself of what no reputation do you see have reputation you're fighting for your you know me You know, because you have reputation to protect, you can't drink such a water. Like John was telling me, he said, you know, lawyers, they don't drink from, they don't drink such a water. They don't drink from, but they don't even drink such a water, not to talk about. He said they drink from the bottle. They, they don't, they drink, they don't drink from the bottle. You can't give them bottle like this with that tumbler to drink. They don't do that. You have to pour it in a glass as lawyers for you because they have reputation and go <laughs> when you serve God yeah, and God will send you to some places when you get there what they are eating if you see the food they eat. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. You can't even look. Like me, that tells you that anything my eyes cannot eat, it can't enter my mouth. Then you send me to that kind of a place. To eat it. Ask me whether I will eat it. I will eat it. I will eat, I'll program my mind. I know the as long as I have this, fine. But I will do it for the sake of the gospel. I will do it for the sake of the gospel. If you say you have reputation to protect, you are not ready to serve God. If you have reputation you want to protect, you are not ready to serve God. 
and why I cannot come to church because my there is no light, never took light, and so I did not have time to iron my clothes, so my clothes are rumpled, and so because of that I will not come to church. And you are a worker in the church. That you are a worker, maybe maybe you are your cell leader or your FCU leader or or your whatever. If you are a worker, you are a worker. You report to church, to the meeting, to the service. Come what may. It's not that. Uh, because because you are you are not serving communion on a Sunday morning, so there is literally nothing to do on Sunday. So you are a worker, you are a worker, you report to church. Keep those your excuses to yourself. I want you, I want you, don't just come, don't just come and tell me, Pastor, you know, I will not be in this meeting because what I want you to do is that I want you to get on your knees next time get on your knees and say father i come before you in the name of jesus christ i want to take permission from you there is a meeting going on in the church today and i will not be able to come because my cousin is doing their 50th anniversary so that's why i don't want to come lord in jesus name thank you for hearing me so when you now come to tell me, you will tell me that, Pastor, I've already taken permission from God. And I will tell you to go. <laughs> we need to reprogram our mind. You see, when God, see, let me show you something. Okay, give me some Psalm 105. I hope it is Psalm 105. How that God proved Joseph when God, when it was time and God proved him. Until the time that his word came, the word of the Lord tried, tried him. 20. The king sent and lose him, even the ruler of the people, and let him go free. Who is he talking about here? He was talking about Joseph. Joseph was arrested by his brothers in the first place, threw him inside the well for him to die. Somebody that came to fetch water saw him and rescued him. The next one, they sold him to Egypt. You see, all this thing that was happening to him, who do you think was behind it? Who do you think was behind it? God. Was he committing any sin? Was clear. And then they brought him to Pharaoh's house. What if an uncle came? For no just so they collected him, put him inside the prison. He was tried. When the time came, you see, that is what I'm saying about God. If you're going to serve God, it was after this. What was God aiming at? To bring him next to who? To king. Next, after Pharaoh, the next was Joseph. If God, if God, see, learn the ways of God. You know, the other day I was teaching you about the ways of the spirit. His ways are not our ways. If God is the one, if he is the one, he wants to bring you up. Look at Jesus Christ. Let this mind be in you as it was also in him. Who though he was God, did not count it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. He brought him down to the ground. He 
before he leaves him. This, is, this has always been God's pattern. Till tomorrow. There is no shortcut to it. You can follow the system and the pattern of the world and there's nothing wrong about it. It's man's own ways of uh, doing there. You can sit and write the exam and then you get promoted. In your, you get to the next class. And when you write the exam, for example, now you write the exam and all of that and you pass and then they promote you. You know, some of the things they do in the in some companies are well established uh, i think they do it in the government establishments and all of you see it and then you write the exam and then you get promoted he said god has helped you god has this one lifting you i will say on your level you will come down to your level we say yes god we thank god But if it's God actually doing it, He wants to bring you up. He will clean you up. Look at Abraham. Look at Isaac. Look at Jacob. Look at Daniel. Look at David. Look at Peter. Look at Paul. That's God's pattern. It's not going to change. So that you'll be able to know, we are talking about service in the kingdom. We are also talking about in the world out there. And may I say, so that you don't misunderstand me, there's nothing wrong about writing an exam or getting promotion and all of that. You know, because you have served for so, so, so number of years, as a result of that, they get promoted and all of that. Yes, I believe you. And I agree with you. And I am not doubting it. All good gifts and perfect gifts, they come from above. But there are promotions and there are promotions. The one that comes from God. When he wants to use you to establish you for a purpose, he will train you by himself. And the way he trains you, you will not like it. He will prune you. How many of you know how to know, know what it means to prune a tree that is bearing fruit? The tree is bearing fruit, though. It's not that it's not bearing fruit. Then the, yeah, my, my mom in those days in the village, they used to be, and my dad. There was one particular year where I was actually looking forward to a particular tree that bears pear. You know, I grew up in the village. I'm, I've been a village champion. So I go to the farm. I, I farm. I went to the farm. I cultivate. I know how to farm the land. I know how to do every single thing in the farm. There's a particular year. I was looking forward to that tree, you know, pear, it, um, uh, to bear the fruit and all of that. I was actually, the next day when I came, I saw the branches and everything cut. Everything, almost the whole branches. <laughs> It was fruit, fruit, that kind, this kind of fruit that is on that road. I was angry. Me, because the fear of my dad was the beginning of wisdom. So I kept quiet. It wasn't long. A few months later, I saw the leaves, everything blossom. I saw many fruits like never but have ever seen so what god does is that he prunes us so that we can bear much fruit but when he brings that his knife to prune us we start when you see the blade because it's very sharp you start crying you become afraid that he's going to kill you he's not killing you he's to prune you to cut off the overweight that you have so that you can be a lightweight so you can fly and you can move faster and so when we don't understand this we we hinder what god is doing we can't advance the course of the kingdom 
The third uniqueness of the Christian service is that it is unique in its character. The reason is because it is motivated, the service of God is motivated by love. Your motivation must be one and the only thing. Not motivated because people are, are encouraging you. Yeah, it is good for people to encourage you. David said, I encourage myself how? In the Lord. When nobody is encouraging you, when nobody is saying, well done, well done, you've done well and all that. Because a lot of us are looking for somebody, if they don't praise you, if they don't create, uh, promote you, if they don't say well done, if they don't give you all those uh, applause and, um, and whatever, you become this, discouraged. They even They don't even recognize what I am doing. No, there is only one person that matters to me. If he says yes to me, even if the whole world is saying no, I am fine. I'm, weary, I'm waiting to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. I'm waiting to hear from you. Say, thank you. You are doing well. If I hear that word, even if every other person is saying the opposite, it won't matter to me. But guess what? We, we want the applause and the accolade that comes from men. Your motivation must not be any other thing. It is not, you are not going to be motivated. Yes, I know that if you serve God, God will bless you. So a lot of people now come to the service of God so that they can be blessed. You have a wrong motive. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, praise and shake it together and running over shall men give unto you. You are giving because you are going to get. You have a wrong motive. What is the right motive? John chapter 3 verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave. You are motivated to serve, to give, to serve and to give. Remember Jesus Christ did not come to be served but to serve and to give. You are motivated to serve and to give only by one means. Love and nothing more. Love for what? Because I love Jesus. Why do I love him? I love him because he first loved me and gave his life for me. That is where the root of your love comes from. If you don't understand this statement, you cannot love God. Why do I love God? Because I love him but he, because he first. It is in response to his love. I'm responding to his love because he is the one that approached me and saved me. Give me John, 1 John chapter 4. Is it verse 10? 1 John 4, 10. We love him. Hearing is love. Not that we love God. Not that you do what? Not that you love God. No but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. This is the reason why I love him. He died for me. He gave his life. He left heaven. He didn't say that he is God. And even when he came down, he didn't identify with the angel. He could have been like we are the body of angels and all of that. The Bible said no. But he took the nature, the form, our own nature, our own form. He became like us. That is why we are called his, his, we are called his brethren. He identified with us. He came down from that his lofty height. These are the things that when I meditate, when I think about it, when I reflect on it. Give me Romans, Rom, um, Romans chapter 5, verse 6. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, Yet, peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. Verse 8, see what he says. 
but God commended his love. This is what the love of God is. For God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet what? Sinners, Christ died for us. I was a sinner, condemned to death, a criminal. I was an outlaw, condemned to death. And there is nothing you can do about it. No one to save you. No court, no judge, no supreme court, nothing. It's only one. And you are guilty as charged. His mercy reached out and he saved me. Has somebody actually saved you from a very precarious situation in your life? Has somebody been able to do that? Maybe some, some very bad event that would have destroyed your life. You have just given up hope. You have just given up everything. You are ready to face your and then somebody just step up maybe it is money maybe it is to talk to somebody maybe whatever it is and the person just came and does that and you get yourself back how do you you know you can never bite that finger in your life that's what God did for us. And he did much more than that. We were enemies of God. Can, he, can, can someone die for his enemy? Can somebody die for his enemy? How many of you have enemies? You know, even if you don't have, you have them in the village. You are one. You have one. Some of you, you have one. Please, I want you to answer me. Has anybody called you one day say, you know, I just want to thank you. I just want to honor you. You know, your life has been just, I just thank God for it. He said, what are you thanking me for? For raising these, your children. For the way you are feeding them and raising them up in the admonition of the Lord. I can see the pain you go through. And Has anybody ever told you that? Yeah? Somebody actually called you and said, I just want to thank you because you are raising your children very well. And you are giving them food and sending them to school. And all this, age, you can you imagine the pain? Nobody does that. But you continue raising. And even your children myself will be even abusing you. And you will say, do what? Pay their bills. You will tell them to sit down. They will stand up. And they yap you and do all kinds of things. And you still... How much more God that does not that has not done anything evil to you? We should be motivated by that kind of love in serving God. That's when, when I think about it, that is what I reflect on. I think about that's my motivation. I love Jesus. And I tell him, I say, Lord, I love you because of what you did. I say, I'm ready. There is nothing you want me to do that I tell me, send me anywhere, anything, anytime. Why? Because he first loved me. That's why Paul was praying. See the reason why? Give me Ephesians chapter 3 verse 17. <clears throat> That Christ might dwell in you richly by, uh, dwell in your heart by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all sense what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height. And to know the love of Christ, you must know it. Quit perfect knowledge. You must know the love of Christ. It is the knowledge of it that will propel you to do the unthinkable for him. It is the knowledge of his love that will constrain. The Bible said the love of God constrains us. If you don't know the love of God, you can't serve him. 
You will still have some things, reservations and all of that. You will not be able to lay down your life. He laid down your life, so you ought to lay down your own life for him. The men of the old, they did it. Abraham did it. Joseph did it. Isaac did it. David did it. Daniel did it. Daniel laid down his life. Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, they laid down their... You know what it means to enter? They know the consequences of disobeying the commandment of the king. They know the consequences. Furnace of fire. It was their life. In the Acts of Apostles, they beat them and commanded them. Not to, they say, we rather obey God than to obey you. We need to know. This is the prayer I pray. You see, I have a lot of dozers of Pauline prayer. There are about 60 of us, more than 60 of them in the Bible. There are more than 60. I took out time. I go there. I pray this prayer. There are many of them I pray. Because I read after Ken, um, uh, E. W. Kenyon about his um, 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 new creation reality. It's where he is. That I, may be, that I may know the love. I want to know the love of Jesus Christ. The love that passes knowledge. That I might be filled with all the fullness of God. When you attain the fullness of God is the love. love. Attaining the love height is the fullness of God. That is the way. That is the height of the knowledge and the power and the glory of God. Because God is love. Don't join this group of people where hey, God is love. Yeah, God loves you. God is, uh, God is nice. God is kind. God is faithful. And God has been so good to me. And God has been so... You are just... You are a baby. You are, you are they are putting feeding... You know, feeding, feeding bottle. That's what they are pouring in your mouth. Hey, um, 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 uh, God, I uh, thank you. Uh, uh, God, you are so good to me. You are so nice. Uh, you have hid. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's what we are doing as a, a Christian. Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 4 tells us he suffered them in the wilderness kept food away from them to prove what is in their heart when he was doing that he was there feeding bottles in their mouth trying it they look for more they look for food no food water no water they cried out and began to abuse Moses why did you bring us here to kill us? It would have been better for us to stay back in Egypt. When we were eating cucumber and melon and carrot. For God so loved the world. Second Corinthians 5, 14. Second Corinthians 5, 14. For the love of Christ constrained us. Because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we were all dead. Verse 15. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. Can you see that? You cannot be living to please yourself. You've got to be living at the expense. Of your life for Christ. They which should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. This is what should be the motivation. When your heart is geared towards that, even when people, thank God, yes, people will say, when they tell you that you are doing well, God bless you, you've been a wonderful blessing, and all of that, fine, good. It's, there is nothing wrong about it. Hello? 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 Because you are not going to quote me out of context. I didn't say there is anything wrong about it. But when, what if it does not come? What if nobody is saying, well done? And meanwhile, you will not know when God is trying you. You will know when God is testing you. Because God is in the business of promoting people. And he can't just promote you anyhow. He doesn't do that. 
even in the ordinary in the school no one promotes you without going through tests of examination they will you write they will set those questions and you will write it and you pass it then you get promoted then God will not say because I love you no it doesn't really matter just go he will not do that So I said the service of God is unique in three ways. The first one is what? It's unique in its source. And that means that what? <clears throat> because somebody died for you. Somebody saved your life. You need to lay down your life as well. That should be, the, you see, the person that you are serving out there didn't die for you. And if you have a problem and all of that, he will not. There is little. No matter how good the person is, he will try his best. But that his best is not enough, will not be enough. I so much believe and pray that I so much love Valerie of the blessed memory. When she was sick and all of that, then my heart, in fact, uh, in the night like this, I would just be groaning, praying. How I wish, what can I do? What can I do to stop this? When thinking about the headache that she complained, and I, I felt the burden and the weight of that thing. With all my prayer and all of that, I'll wake up in the night, I will pray and pray and pray and finish sleep. Is it money? Is it a... so? But at the end of the day, God still took her. There is an extent to which you can help. It's God that will decide the ultimate. If you serve Him, if you serve him faithfully, if you honor God with your life, God will honor you. Not only will he will honor you in this life, he will honor you in the life to come. And our greatest hope is that life continues. Life does not, and this place is a temporal place. I would rather offend you and please him as I'm talking to you, I will rather offend you, each and every one of you here. I will rather offend you and please him than to displease him and offend you. Because if I'm ready to please him, I know I can please you. I don't want to be men's pleasers when it comes to the things of God. A main pleaser is that I might see you do something that is wrong, that is not good. I will not tell you. Because if I tell you, you will feel bad. And then you may not be talking to me again. And then you may not be sowing seed again to me. And then I will be hungry. And then I will start looking for what to steal. No, I will not do that. That is why you have to live a life, a, a simple life. Let your need, if you want to serve God, if you want to be a pleaser of God and not a pleaser of man, you, your need must be simple. Your needs must be few. If you're the type that hang yourself up there and all of that, with the high and the mighty and all of that, you will have a problem. You want to please everybody around. One thing that God hates. Give me First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26, 28, or 26. First Corinthians 1. Yeah, and the best thing is, okay, verse 27, say, Brethren, for you see your calling. 26. He said, for brethren, for you see you are calling brethren, how that not many wise of men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Verse 27. 
But God had chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God had chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. Verse 28, and the best things of the world and the things which are despised had God chosen, yea, and the things which are not, to bring to naught things which are. 29, that no what flesh shall do what does that make any meaning to you? You know why God is doing all this? Because he does not want any man to glory in his presence. Amen. <clears throat> so let's move to the next. Let's look at who is the servant. Who is a servant of God? How many people are here are servants of uh, the servant of God? Can we welcome some? We can notice. I can see some servants of God who are here. Is there any servant of God? Any man of God? Who? Is there anyone here? Do we have any servant of God in the house? There is. A, okay, no. <laughs> there is no servant of God in there. <laughs> Do we have any servant of God? You know, I've been in meetings and in program and conventions. And uh, please, uh, I will just want to take out time and recognize some great servants of God in the house in our meeting. Please, if you uh, just uh, to observe all the protocol, is there any great servant of God in the house here? And uh, and everybody. Nobody. The deceitfulness and the cunning of men lying in wait to deceive. Fake doctrines, wrong teachings. Wrong, bad. Can we look at the scriptures? Who is a servant of God? You know, we talk about the clergy, <coughs> the ladies, the priests. Please, just give me First Peter chapter 2, verse 5. If this one talks about you, I want you to say, yeah. If he doesn't talk about you, just keep quiet. You also, <coughs> as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. How many of us are priests? How many people here are priests? What about our pastors? Are you not priests? If you are a priest, can I see your hand up? If you are, how do you speak it in Yoruba? Because, uh, hmm? If you are Afa, <laughs> eh? Alufa. If you are Alufa, Lufa, Alfa is for Muslim, Alufa is for Christians. Alufa, how many of you are Alufa? <laughs> if you are a priest, can I see your hand up? <clears throat> you also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood. I am a priest, not because I am ordained as a pastor. No. Everybody that is born of God, everybody that is a Christian, 
is a priest. Don't mind those of them that give their title. Their title. You have the right reverend. You have the left reverend. Then you have the very reverend. These are man's creation. Somebody just sat down. It's man's idea. That's why I don't follow anything that doesn't, I don't see reason to it, I will drop it. It's mad. Somebody sat down and came up with that idea and began to do it. You want to do wedding on, a, on your wedding, wedding day, you go and buy wedding gown. Those white things, the one that is covered the whole of this thing, and then you, you enter inside it. It is man's idea, true or false. Somebody sat down one day and thought of it and then sell it. And then it became a tradition. And I am not obligated to do it. On my wedding day, I might decide to wear my Ankara or wear shorts and whatever. Nothing, there is nothing wrong about it. Nothing, absolutely nothing. <clears throat> I have delivered myself or deliver yourself. <clears throat> if you don't want, that's your business. Cynthia, did you wear that, that thing that day? Did you? Okay, yeah, I remember she wore it. Uh, it's, it's the one and only wedding in a lifetime. Hello, there is nothing wrong about it. Follow them. Follow their footsteps. I don't have any problem. My daughters are going to get married, and if they want to wear the one that will cover the Zoho house, that's your business. My own job that day is who give this daughter in marriage. I am the one. I have delivered me that is, I, I'm delivered. Deliverance is here. Simplicity. When I talk, I say hey, that is Jesus Christ, but you are following him. He said, Look unto him as your author and finisher. After his resurrection, as a resurrected Christ, find out those of them who have encountered Jesus Christ. Who had, had seen visions of Christ. You see the kind of designers where he wears on his foot and the kind of designers robe. And with all the jewels and all the makeup and everything. Simple. When you get to heaven the same way, you see, the higher you go, the simpler you become. But the lower you fall, the more complicated you become. In his simplicity. How many of you have seen Bill Gates? <laughs> You've seen his. How many of you have seen Bill Gates in the video of films? What type of designer's outfit does he wear? I saw him one day. I saw him on the down the uh, t television. He was white canvas he was wearing with these daddy jeans that are crazy jeans with t-shirts one of the richest men in the world you are not you are not even rich in your family but the kind of thing you are wearing nobody will hear your word you're wearing wig 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 you're wearing is is up to a million naira week on your head. Is it not? Deliver yourself for. So I said, every believer is a priest, and as a priest, you serve. Every believer is to be a functioning member of the body of Christ. 
In the New Testament, there is no special class of person called ministers or clergymen or priests. There is no special person. No. 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 But this is what you have heard all your time, all your life, ever since, even before you got born again. He has made us priests and kings unto God, and we shall reign with him. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a peculiar people called out. This tribe, this tribe is all priesthood. Everybody is a priest from the Levitical priest order. Why I'm emphasizing this? So that you don't single yourself out and remove yourself from the equation. You are part of that equation. And so that is why I read, as lively soon uh, built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. Romans chapter 12, verse 4. And as a priest, you have a place in the house. Romans 12, 4 and 5. For we, for as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same... Say all members have not the same office. Tell somebody beside you, I have an office. My office is different from yours. How many of you believe it? Now the question is, what is your office? What is your office? Because priests, they serve. True or false? Priests, they serve. They have office. I have an office. You that is sitting down there, you have an office. Find out your office so that you can function as a priest. So we being many are one body in Christ and every one member, every one members one of another. First Corinthians 12, 12, please. Just be a little bit fast. Or faster. For as the body is one and had many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, or so also is what? Christ. Verse 18. Just go to verse 18. <clears throat> but now had God set the members, every one of them in the body, as he has done what? Pleased him. Did God set you in the office? Has God set you up in the office? Did God set you in the office? Did God put you in any office? Answer me yes or no. Do you know that if you do not function in that office, the consequences is much. You will not have an excuse. We keep saying it. You will not have an excuse. You will not escape on the day of judgment. Please don't forget that there is the judgment seat of Christ. There is eternal judgment. Please put it in front of your mind, not at the back. Have it in front of your mind. That is why there is the basic doctrines of Christ. These things are taught. So that you don't just be a Christian that comes to church once in a yellow moon or once in a blue moon. You are saved to serve God. You are not just saved in order to remain a blessed man. You are saved to serve. And to serve God and to serve in his kingdom. Serve in the gospel. You are not outside the body. You are within the body of Christ. What is the objective of a servant of God? What is primarily in your mind as a servant of God? What is the major focus 
what is it that preoccupies your mind as a servant? Give me what, Psalm 123 verse 2. There is only one objective in your mind as a servant that you come to serve God. One thing that is in your mind, one objective. Behold, as the eyes of the servant look unto the hand of their masters, the eyes of the servant looks unto what? The hand of their master. So the master, this is the master, and their eyes are fixed on his hand, what he has to do what he has to give them, what he has to take from them. They are look, in other words, their eyes are fixed on him. They don't have any other place to look at. They don't have any other person to look at. They are looking unto him. They are at his beck and call. He said, Behold, that the eyes of the servant look unto the hand of, of their master, and as the eyes of a maiden unto the hand of her mistress. You've seen a maiden, somebody who is serving his madam and all of that. He's always there. He's, they, call it, they call it a personal assistant. They call it ADC. They call it whatever it is. You don't, you are not distracted. He is your focus. You are watching him. You are looking up to him. You know. You know when he calls. The meaning of that call or whatever. Even before you can preempt him. Because you have stayed there. You have looked at him. You have followed him. Any move he makes, you know what it means. When he says, does like this, you already know what he's saying. He said, and as the eyes of the maiden unto the hand of her mistress, so our eyes wait upon who? The Lord our God until that he have mercy upon us. So you look as a servant. You keep looking unto Jesus Christ. You are there. Your mind, one thing is in your mind, to do the will of God. In other words, is to do the will of God. That's what that scripture is saying. John chapter 4, verse 34. John chapter 4, verse 34. Jesus said unto them, My meat, my concentration, my obsession is to do what? Is to do the will of God. That is my... They say he was hungry. And so the disciples, they went to buy food for him. And so on return, on their return, they saw him talking to one woman. So they figured that this woman, because you said that you are hungry and you are famished and you are about to faint and all of that. And so we hurriedly went to town to buy you food. And on their way back, they saw the person that was almost feeling like dying, talking to another person, a woman. And so they figured that the, the woman had given them or somebody had given him food to eat. And they said, Lord, wow. He said, you don't understand. You don't know my meat. My meat is not this one that you go. My meat, that is what is consuming my life. My passion is to do the will of him that sent me. And to finish it. We are talking about Christian service. That's why it is called maturity class. It's not for babies. In other words, you don't have any other will. You don't have any other. Remember, you have laid down your life. You remember, you don't have any other life apart from his. Okay. Number two is that your desire, also your passion, not only to do his will, but to please him. To be a pleaser, not just that you do his will. You do it in a way that pleases him. John 8, 29. And he that sent me is with me. The Father had not left me alone. For I do always those things that do what? Please him. Always. What are the things that please God? You do it in a way and manner that pleases him. If you want to serve him, you serve him honorably. Don't give him half-hearted service. Today you are here. 
the next day you are not there. They look for you in your duty post and you are not found there. And you are giving, re- you are supposed to be looking on to him. Gazing at, just like the handmaiden is looking on to her mistress. And so when the mistress now call you, you find out that you have gone to fetch water. You find out that you have gone to the market. You find out that you have gone somewhere else and you know what he will do to you. Second Timothy chapter 2 verse 4. No man that worried entangled himself with the affairs of this life, that he might do what? <laughs> Entangling yourself with the affairs of this life. Affairs, business affairs, social affairs, community affairs, people affairs. There are so many things. If it's in the East, those people that live in the East, their God is their money. They are ready to die. If you come to the West, they will block every road, even express. They will. They are ready to block express. And we are shipping. And then they cook food, the meat they cook is beet is like the, to eat it, you carry two hands to be able to eat it. They go to borrow clothes. They turn their father that died 40 years ago. They say he's been lying on one side and it's very painful. So they need to turn him in the grave. I saw I saw all sorts in Ibadan. But our Igbo men. They will kill their father. They will kill their mother. They will kill their brother. Slaughter their sister. Slaughter the unborn child in the womb because of money. Wicked. Their heart is darker than this evil man that has not been touched by God. I'm not going to be born again. Go, go to the market and buy. That's why if I go to the market to buy anything, if you are Igbo, I will not buy from you. They've, they've, they've dealt with me severally. He say, my brother, you know you are my people. My brother, you know you are my people. You know you are my people. You know you are my people. Is it not from the east you come? We are brother. You know, you know why he's telling you all this? So that you drop your guards. Then he will sharp, his knife, he has already sharpened it. The moment your money enters his hand, there, while you are looking at him and you change your mind about that, he will not give you that money back. And you can call police, yo, bring the army. He will not give you that money until you threaten his life. I don't know who's who for us. So every tribe and all of that, they have their own. You go to the north, their own is they don't have parts too. You want me to talk about them? Give me Luke chapter 17. Verse 7. Let's move on fast. But which of you, having a servant plowing or feeding cattle, will say unto him by, by and by, when he has, when he is come from the field, go and sit down to meet, that is to eat. Your servant, he has served you, you have done you, worked with him in the farm and all of that, and now you are back to the house. You are tired and he is tired. And then you tell him, just, just go and find something and eat and relax. He said, I will not rather say unto him, and will not rather say unto him, make ready wherewith. I may sup and get thyself and serve me till I have eaten and drunken and afterward thou shalt eat and drink. You don't go and treat yourself. Is your master first. He 
you would think that this person is wicked, is it not? You would think that he is talking Jesus Christ, he's talking about himself and in relationship to us, how we should serve him. He's giving us a pain, he's painting a picture. You know, when you say, I'm so tired, and I pass on, pass on. <laughs> hey, can I go, Pastor? Can I go? I say, You can go. Because what? You are tired and fagged out. You are not a servant, you are a hireling. God will not commit weightier matters into your hand. Look at Joshua. Moses. Moses went up to the mount. Joshua stayed at the foot of the mount. For how many days Joshua was there? He did not take, he didn't leave until his master came down and was through before he left. You know what we do? When they are already angry with you that you, you say that you are going to close by 8.30 and you already ate for the 15 minutes, uh, you are, they are already abusing you in their hearts. Say he calls himself, he says he has integrity. He says he is a man of his word. He says, Pastor, you know you are a man of your word. They, when they want to find a way out, he says, Pastor, you know you are a man of your word. You know I know you, you are a man of your word. You don't go. I asked them a question. If it is in your office, your boss is still in the office. You are meant to close by 5. By 6 o'clock, your boss is still in the office. Will you go? You will not go. Because you don't have a boss in the church. <laughs> Pastor, are you also a boss? Till I have eaten and drunken, and afterward thou shalt eat and drink. Verse 9. Doth he thank this, that servant because he had did, because he did the things that were commanded him? I throw not. Did he thank the servant? You that is waiting for somebody to say thank you, well done. You are, you are, you, we appreciate you in short. You know, the, why I love these churches is because they appreciate people. He said, I did not. This is Jesus. You think he's wicked? If God cannot train you under a man, he can't stand for God. You know, all these things, you find fault in everything. Find complain, you murmur, you talk, you do. You know, when you are doing that, God will just leave you. Because he will never promote you. He will never take you to the next. You will remain there. Other people will come, write that same day exam and all of that. They will pass, move on to the next. You will remain there. You, if you promote yourself, <laughs> I would rather God promote me than man promote me. You know, so as a servant, you know what it means. Give me um, 1 Corinthians 6.19. That's the life of a servant. First Corinthians 6, 19. What know you not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? Verse 20. For you are what? How many of you were bought with a price? What does it mean to buy somebody? When you buy somebody, it means you have you own that person. That person is your property. You decide what you want to do with that person or not. Is it not? Now, this is my glasses. I bought it with my money. Is it not? I, it is no longer the property of the owner before. I have bought it with my money. It belongs to me. If I like, now I will break it. If I like, I will turn it this way. If I like, I will turn it at the back and put it at the back and all of that. If I like, I will smash it on the ground. 
if I like, I will not use it again. I will do whatsoever I want. He doesn't have a mind of his own. He doesn't have a will of his own. You have been bought. There is a price over you. You must know this. There is a price over you. You are no longer going to live on the basis of what you think. We are, you. First John, give me John chapter 1, verse 14. Fast, please, fast. I don't want to stay more than 10 minutes here anymore. And the word of God made flesh and dwelt among us and behave his glory as of the Son, the begotten Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. Yes. John bear witness 16 and 17. Give me 12, please. It's not 16. Give me, go to 12. But as many as received him to them, gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Yes, verse 13. Which we are born, not of the blood, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Not of the will of the flesh, not of the will of man, not of blood of man, but of God is one that has begotten you. You bought, he bought you. There is a price. They claim you were a slave. They are going to slaughter you and, and finish with you. And he came on the scene and said, how much is the cost of uh, Uzo's, Uzo? How much is his cost? Is the cost the price over his, he said his life. He said, okay. Then he used his son, exchange, and then he brought you. You become his slave. That is why we are slaves of Jesus Christ. But the slave of Christ is a free man. He is not. He, you are not a slave that you don't have. The the, you know what you know what David said in Psalm sixty three. He said his loving kindness is better than life. You see that life you have. His love is better than that your life. If you know the love of God that passes all knowledge. If we can only yield to that love, yield is in the heart. So that we stop obeying Ephesians chapter 6, verse 6. Ephesians 6, 6. We stop obeying it. And what does it say? Ephesians 6, 6. Not with eye service as men please us anymore. You don't live to please men. But doing the will of God from where? From the heart. Galatians 1.10 tells us the same thing. Galatians chapter 1 verse 10, it tells us the same thing. For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of who? Because my heart is always geared to serving God, finding the will of God and all of that. You stay on the will of God I want to. You will not be men's pleaser. And finally, I'll just rush to this. The service, you know, we've been talking about serving God and all of that. What are those services? Because the Bible talks about service that are acceptable. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 28 tells us. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 28 tells us about acceptable service. We are for we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God what? Acceptably. There is acceptable service. There are services that are not acceptable my brothers. And you need to find out what they are. What are those services that you can render to God that are acceptable that, so that God will say, well done, good and faithful servant, come into the joy of the Lord so that God will bless you here and bless you in the life to come. And what are those acceptable services? Number one, you offer your body as a living sacrifice. Romans chapter 12, your body as a living sacrifice. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy acts unto God, holy acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. 
You must live a holy life. You must be holy in your heart. You must be holy on your body. You won't wear a bikini. Is it not bikini they call it? You won't dress all those funny, useless dressing. You don't wear them. You must keep your body clean. The Bible tells us we need to know how to hold our vessel in sanctification. There are things you do not do. There are places you don't go. There are things you don't watch. There are things you don't listen to. Come out from among them and be ye separate. Keep yourself. You are a servant of God. You are a priest. A holy priest for that matter. Number two. Give me Malachi chapter 2 verse 7. Please fast. A priest must be holy in his conduct or in her conduct. For the priest, the priest's lips should keep what? Knowledge and they should seek the law at his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. That you are a servant of God, you must fill yourself with the knowledge of God. You must be taught. People must come to you and they will want to hear the word of God from your mouth. Not you, not being able to divide the word of God. You must be rich in the word of God as a priest, as a servant. Because before you serve God, you have to know his mind. And you find the mind of God, the will of God and all of that from his word. You can't just afford to be novice. First Corinthians four one. Please fast. Let a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ and steward of the mysteries of God. There is a mystery. Oracle of God was committed into your hand. You are the one that is guarding it. The word, the message. You have to protect that message. So you must be given to the knowledge of God's word. You must search knowledge. You must seek knowledge. You must study to show yourself approved, a right workman, not being ashamed of himself, but rightly dividing the word of truth. Number three is that you must be found faithful. First Corinthians chapter, go, give me verse two of that same First Corinthians four. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man should be found what faith. Do you know what is faithfulness? You know what it means to be faithful. You are a husband. You are a mother. You remain a mother till you die. You remain a husband to your wife till you die. You remain a father to your children. You remain a mother to your children. You don't back out. You don't back down. You don't stop at any time, T. You are faithful in doing that thing. You don't get tired and fact that, that. I remember the equipment that I say you must have. Perseverance. Faithfulness in, go, in the work of God. God commits something. He look, you are trusted with that thing. Remain faithful. Remain dedicated. Another one is, uh, the next one is diligent. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 22. You say you need to be diligent. That is making every effort. Make effort. Don't just take a no for an answer. They say no, you just go. Go and do this thing. You give one million and one reason why you cannot, why it is not possible. You know, eh? this is how we are brought up in the ministry, in the service of God. 
my pastor there. If you want to be in his good book, you must understand his language. There is nothing like impossible. There is nothing like no. If he sends you to go and do something, you are going to get it done. That is the reason why he sent us. I, he, I was sent to Abuja. Nobody gave me one night. You see, you see what we are doing here? We are just... We are just If I say that we are just pampering you, he's uh... a... <laughs> Hello? Hello? You can be saying anything you are saying in your heart. When we came here to start Oak House Church, no cobble, no money, no help, no body, nothing. from nowhere it was because of the training who is benefiting now but if I had started sulking and abusing and complaining and even leave the ministry then would I be here today the answer is no You have not taken time to go. You know, when I think about a quarter, it's a mystery to me till today. If you see how that place was, is a dustbin. Not just that, it's a swamp. The dustbin is the height of dustbin is like the height of this building. Up to two or two and a half plots. The depth. The dead, they say the guy was telling us if he put a little pole, it will swallow it. That's where we went to and started feeling how many millions. Where did the money come from? If you ask me today, I don't know. This one here, the same thing. We have never borrowed one naira from anybody. We've never borrowed money from anybody. We've not begged anybody for anything. We don't take tithes from people. Who is supposed to be taking tithes? Who should it be? Is it not me? So that we can have money. But we don't take tithes. We have never for one day raised money from people. I told you what happened to me the day I wanted to raise money. I entered, I climbed this pulpit down. To open my mouth, something blew my mouth. It was straining. You don't give because you don't have. You know when we say give, you 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 don't be when we say give you oak house church, you don't give. When we give you you think we are asking you to give so that we will be you have not been giving, I have been living. Many of you have never for one day bring out, even if it is 500 naira, and say, Pastor, I want to give you this money. Many here have never done that. The person that has been born, except that you are not being blessed. And I'm not forcing, I'm not, you give, you don't give, it doesn't bother, and I don't preach it, and I don't want to talk about it, and I don't like it. I want to talk like Paul. I have converted no man's wealth or money. As a matter of fact, I worked with my own hand so that nobody will put any whatever on me and say, if not because of... You see, Abraham, they say, Abraham, say, I will not take nothing from you. All that I need you to do, you see, these men that went to you, went to war with you, settle them. Don't, I won't take, even, not, even if it's a large from you, I can't take Lest you say that you are the one that made me. is God. Me and God. So I said, offer your body a living sacrifice. You have to go for the knowledge of God. You have to remain faithful in service. You have to be diligent in service. According to 2 Corinthians 8.22 that we read, you can also find I don't have to go there. And then in 
again, another one is that you have got to serve God in righteousness. Luke chapter 1, verse 73 to 75. The oath which he swore to our father as Abraham, that he will grant us unto us that we being delivered out of our the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear. In verse 75, in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our lives. You serve God in righteousness. For the kingdom of God is not in meat and drink, but in righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Ghost. Another way is peace and then joy. Peace, you remember if you go to give anything to someone and you find out that there is a problem between you and the person, go settle. God is interested in peace. If you don't make peace with that person, forget about whatever it is that you are offering. Because if you offer that thing, it is not acceptable. God will not bless you. God will not honor you. The people that you are serving and all of that could get blessed, but you, you have no record. So there, these are the, what is called acceptable service to God. And those acceptable service, there are seven of them. I said the, the last one is joy in the Holy Ghost. The joy of the Lord is your strength. You are serving God not with a grown face, not with a... Um, uh, uh, you configure your face and disfigure your face and you are frowning and you are doing it out of compulsion as if, uh, you know, there is no joy in you. God doesn't accept any of such things. You must be happy and full of joy. Keep doing that. Being full of joy, serving God. Be excited you are serving God. It's a privilege that is very few given to people. If God calls you to serve him, you first of all, like my wife will say, you first of all kneel down and then bless him and thank him and all of that before you engage because he's the greatest honor and privilege given to you to serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So I said there are seven of them. The first one is what? Offer your body. Number two, go for knowledge. Number three, faithfulness. Number four, Diligent, number five, serve God in righteousness, number six, be at peace with your brother before you offer anything, and then finally, do it with joy in your heart. And of course, you know finally that every service, the service you give to God must be tested, both here and in the time to come. And you find it in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13 and 15. In verse 13 to 15, every man's work must be what? Tested. Not only will your work be tested, you yourself will be tested. Your works will also be tested. If you are tested and you are found wanting, you go down with your works. Of course, in your works is nowhere. So you yourself will be tested and the works that you do will also be tested. And again, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5 tells us that the motive of your heart, the reason behind what you are doing, why you are doing that, why you are serving God, why you are doing all those things you are doing, you know there is an inner, inner motive. And we've said that the only thing that will be your motive that will motivate you to serve God and all of that is because you love God. That should be your motivation. Whatever it is that you are doing to that brother, you are saying to that brother must be born out of love. It must be because you love the person. You want to help the person. You want to save the person. And of course, you know, the third one is that the quality of your work also counts. That's why you say every man's work must be tested by fire. The fire is to test the, how the quality. So God is interested in quality more than quantity. If it is not, then he won't be testing it with fire. And when he burns, the things that are not, that cannot stand, the fire will go. Fire is the one that purifies. God is looking for quality. Many are called, but few are chosen. You can win the whole world at the end of the day. What is the quality of the people that you brought into the kingdom? That's what counts. It's not that you have, you are spread everywhere. The quality of the people. 
And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that had left house or brethren or sister or father or mother or wife or children or land for my sake and for the gospel. Verse 20, 30. But he shall receive an hundredfold when? Hundredfold when? Now, in this time, what? He will receive houses. He will receive brethren. He will receive sisters. He will receive mothers. He will receive children and lands with what? Persecution. And in the world to come. So eternal life is not now. It is for the next world. You don't have it now. So when you say you will receive hundredfold now in this life, houses. Houses is in which way? Sometimes physical houses. Somebody people give you house. Or there is no place now. No, is there any house now? Any of you that I will come to your house? You ask me, Pastor, who are you looking for? Will anybody do that? You will just open your door wide and I will come. You will be happy that we came. As I have houses, I can. And if I want to come and pitch my day, I say, Uzo, I'm coming to sleep in your house today. Will you tell me not to come? I will come. If I tell Yakub I'm coming, if I tell Chinedu, if I tell Mrs. Stella, he will go out to the bus court and prepare one house for me. I have a lot of brothers now. I have a lot of... So if you... Because in those days, I gave up. I said for four years in the school, I, the, I, they say if I don't want to renounce being born again, I should leave the family. I left. For four years, I didn't see my father and mother. I didn't see my village. I didn't see nobody. If they finish school, I will go to another person's house and stay. From there, I will go back to school. For four years, I didn't know nobody. I didn't hear from anybody. Because they sent me to go. It was my mom that now mother's heart. He started looking for me. He was sending messages saying I should come. So one day, because I have a church heart, I now decided to go home. But today, I have so many brothers, I have so many sisters, I have so many mothers, I have so many children everywhere, all over. That's what, the same thing to you, the same thing applies to you, true or false. But if you are, you see, you see my cousin, my, 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 my father, my this and my dad and all of those things, it doesn't have. If you hold on to them, you won't have this. Amen. 